Mesdames et Messieurs, bonjour et bienvenue au deuxième jour de rencontre stratégique de la Méditerranée. Nous sommes ravis de vous accueillir pour certains pour le premier jour, pour d'autres pour le deuxième jour, pour cette deuxième journée qui s'annonce particulièrement riche. Pour ceux qui n'ont pas eu l'opportunité d'être présents pour le premier jour de ces rencontres, nous avons atteint un nombre très important d'inscrits et, et de participants. Nous avons donc mis en place une retransmission dans la salle Colbert à la salle Bonaparte, comme c'était le cas hier, et nous prévoyons également une transmission de la salle Rémi en salle Durand-Durville au premier étage. Now, just to keep uh, going on with the practical aspects, we, you are provided with translation headphones or sets available on the ground floor. Return the uh, headphone to recover your um, ID document. For the Q&A session, we still use the Flydo software, and all participants are free to uh, ask questions online thanks to the QR code, except for the two major speakers, keynote speakers uh, today and at 2 o'clock today, now, where there will be roving microphones in the room. With no further ado, it gives me great pleasure in welcoming Mrs. Nathalie Loiseau, who is president of the Subcommission of Security and Defense in the European Parliament and of the European Delega Parliament delegation to the Uh, for the uh, partnership between United Kingdom and Europe. She's also a member of the uh, Commission of Foreign Affairs. She was a member of the Special Commission on Foreign uh, um, in, uh, Interferences. Mrs. Loiseau was also a Renaissance uh, uh, election list leader for the European election. She is the Minister of European and Foreign Affairs from the 2017 to 2019, she was also director of the National School of Administration for five years, from 2012 to 2017. And uh, she's a diplomat in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. She studied at the Paris, uh, uh, Institute Politique Paris, and also at the Institute of uh, Oriental Languages and Culture. She's also the author of several books, War That We Don't See Coming, as well as an essay on the right of women Uh, entitled Select Everything and Two Comic Strips, Democracy and Europe. And uh, with no further ado, please uh, welcome Mrs. Nathalie Loiseau on stage, our first keynote speaker today. Bonjour à, bonjour à toutes et, et à tous. Euh, je voudrais euh, remercier les organisateurs de ce très bel événement, de m'avoir euh, fait signe. J'ai accepté sans hésiter. Accepted with no uh, problem because I do believe strongly in the uh, meeting between the various cultures, professional culture, between uh, pathways and uh, life uh, uh, process between the two shores of the Mediterranean. Uh, Die, which is absolutely needed today. And uh, leaving Paris or leaving Brussels, uh, we, when we do that, we have to think and uh, clearly uh, do a kind of a brainstorming. So I'm very happy to open the second day with you to, even though what I'm going to talk about is, of course, uh, not always uh, shiny. Yet, 34 years ago, almost to the day, the Berlin Wall collapsed, and some claimed a bit uh, uh, urgently the end of history because uh, Germany was reunifying, Europe, Central Europe was doing its Velvet Revolution, the Soviet Union was disintegrating, and we thought we had won. Well, in fact, we had done no fight. We. Uh, We took advantage of the uh, peace uh, benefits. We ignored, you know, we, we lowered our defense budget and we fell asleep. And I was a diplomat for 27 years, so trust me, I know exactly what I talk about, and this is self-criticism. There, there isn't one day without me thinking about uh, the collective mistakes, European, Western, and successive mistakes. Among the mistakes, I have a cruel memory of the ambassador who said that if one day Yugoslavia would break, 
uh, apart, he says, by laugh. You know, we had to have the horror of uh, Bosnia, the, the, the Yugoslavian war, and the, we've sold the black decade in, Alger, in Algeria. And of course, the GIA had to come and hit us in France for us to understand. Yet we could not quite measure fast enough that the jihadist terrorism would threaten France for a long time and soon the Sahel. We've seen the Iran Springs, and we thought that, like in Europe, democracy would prevail, you know, by itself. That the fall of Gaddafi would uh, lead to the birth would lead to the birth of a state in uh, Libya without our help. That Bashar would fall in a couple of weeks, and civil society in Syria would rapidly reject the Islamists, who were still, nevertheless growing in number in Syria. Everything I'm saying here, I heard it and many times. So it took the Bataclan to realize that Daesh had become a threat for Europe and for France. Between Israel and Palestine, we celebrated the Oslo Agreement. That was also 30 years ago. And we felt that peace was closed without thinking that, saying that since the assassination of Anwar al-Sadat and the assassination of Rabin, since the political victory of the Hamas in Gaza and the control of uh, the Hezbollah of uh, deliquescent uh, Lebanon and the and the situation was becoming uh, more difficult in uh, in in the west in the West Bank. You know, we couldn't see the, the, the tragedy coming. And the least of our mistake is an is absolute tragedy. No, we understand that tragedy is back into history. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we are responsible for what is happening in the Arab world, in Libya, in Alge you know, in a, uh, the, spi the spiral of violence triggered by the Hamas. Responsibility is first and foremost that of the players of the tragedies. We didn't want them. We did not encourage them. And maybe it was impossible to stop that. So this is what makes a difference between our democracies from countries like Iran, Iran or um, Russia, who is, are throwing salt on the wounds. But anyway, we did not understand what the fire was under the, 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 the ash, but you know, so close to us in the Mediterranean Sea. It took we needed a shock, total war of Russia against Ukraine for us to lose our last illusions. I mean, it's t uh, funny to talk about Ukraine here while we talk about the mission, but I think so. I think nevertheless it is essential because Ukraine was part of our mistakes. We cl we classified Donbass after 23 and the annexation, the, the, the uh, annexion of uh, of Crimea and the third of separatists among the frozen conflicts, very much like the high caravan against Armenia, Azerbaijan. These uh, expressions, I invite you to push it away from our vocabulary, erase it from our vocabulary. There is no frozen conflict, only conflicts that we forgot, we ignored, and which could start again anytime. That it, the war was back in High Karabakh in 2020, and again, we didn't understand all the consequences. Europe tried to be a mediator. You know, we were very naive without understanding that, uh, you know, uh, the authoritarian regime in Baku only believed in the law of the strongest. In a few days uh, this fall, uh, ethnic cleansing took place in High Karabakh. The Armenian people had uh, experienced the first genocide of the 20th century. He, uh, it experienced the first clinic, uh, ethnic cleansing of the 21st century. So three families are three families are left where 120,000 people were uh, been living for centuries. Now, if I talk about this today, is to insist on the fact that Europe is still, nevertheless, in the time with experiencing a time of innocence and what role played our neighbor Turkey as a su who supports which support Azerbaijan Turkey wants to join the European Union it is a member of NATO but Turkey is the archetype of regional powers of the 21st century it will use uh, st uh, strengths rather than law transactional in each alliance ready to to, to listen author, to listen to authoritarian regimes than democracy. I'll come back to it, uh, unavoidable 
and controllable, certainly. But let's go back to Ukraine, because I said, in my opinion, that was indispensable. To insist on its significance, its importance, its uh, branches, and its cons uh, consequences. The meaning, first, well, we're dealing here with a pure aggressive war with no justification, no clear justification, no motive against a sovereign state which was no threat for its neighbor. We are exactly in the same uh, system uh, when uh, Iraq invaded. Kuwait, uh, which was actually, uh, you know, supported by an international alliance, you know. The use of force without motive would be green lighting all those who tomorrow would want to do the same. So what has Vladimir Putin against Ukraine? The fact that it is independent, free, and it has, it has opted for democracy. This war is more than a regional conflict. It fits within a heavy trend where the U.S., don't want to no longer want to be the the the, uh, the sort of the policing uh, force of the world, and they just want to shift to the uh, Pacific, to their and uh, deal with their rivalry with China. Authoritarian regimes uh, actually challenge the international order, and they wish to impose a new international disorder. Now let's mention one conflict that the intervention of Russia was able to solve. None. Now let's look at Syria. You know, Obama pulled back. Iran, Russia, Turkey are present in only one purpose, to maintain their sphere of influence. You know, and this cost half a million lives and half a million refugees. We can say the same thing about Armenia, which is uh, the victim of the competition of power, or Libya. The, the extension of Ukraine war are quite significant as well, because if Russia is attacking Russia, uh, Ukraine, militarily speaking, at the same time it is doing several hybrid wars in, in the world, in Europe, in France, cyber attacks, you know, uh, mi uh, uh, fake news, manipulation of migration flows, you know, uh, possible uh, capture of our elites. We've seen that with the... Uh, the David stars tagged around the Paris area, and now we know for sure that they were actually uh, initiated and made possible and made public by a destabili Russian destabilization operation. In Africa, in uh, around the Mediterranean, in the private militia, you know, they used to be called Wagner, but their name will change, but they will continue. Disinformation, support to coup, the uh, this hybrid war, you know, is uh, something that Russia has learned to do in Ukraine, in Moldavia, in the Balkans. And there, again, we were very naive. Today, still, uh, the Russian disinformation on Ukraine, on the Middle East, you know, is full blast, going full blast, even within our societies. Finally, and of course, the consequences of Ukraine war are global. You know, uh, blackmailing with hydrocarbons, you know, uh, mafia economy, uh, um, serial blackmailing. Nobody can say this war is not my war. Nobody should apply a two, you know, a sort of a relativism and thinking that this war and the Russian threats are just a Western issue or even European issue or even the opportunity to do good business. In that respect, Ukraine has awakened Europe and has somewhat uh, boosted the European defense, which has made more progress in 18 months than in 60 years. You probably note, you may note that I'm talking about European defense and not about Europe of defense, simply because Europe of defense is only we in France use this term. It is essential for us to understand that Europe is not France's larger size and the European defense does not rest solely on French ideas, no matter how smart they are. Let's remember that we were the, uh, we buried the first uh, project of defense, European project, and our partners remember that, that we, for a long time, we rejected what uh, your Central European countries said about the Russian threat. We should be wise to understand that having spent several years convincing our European neighbors uh, to be involved in Sahel, we had to leave Sahel after a while. And you 
gain more credibility when you are, uh, or, you know, you look at the world as it is. But it is the President of the Republic since 2017 has uh, launched, a pro uh, wants to relaunch European defense. And a lot has been done in a short time. It is strategic compass, this uh, white paper of European defense. And I was told when I was asked, uh, when I asked uh, Joseph Borrell and I made it the condition for the vote of my group to confirm it to the, as high representative, uh, it was he said it was impossible and nobody uh, would, would do that. Well, this strategic compass does exist and it is the first exercise where we pooled in Europe our assessment of threats and it was a useful exercise for public services. Uh, just before that, we, up we adopted the European Defence Fund since uh, February 2022, we are now using the European Facility for Peace, which makes it possible to finance uh, uh, mat military material uh, supply to partners, including Ukraine. We installed a training for uh, Ukrainian soldiers uh, at a scope that had never been done before. Remember that the training of our partners were limited to one company here and there for six months, two years, and that uh, since last year, we've trained in Europe more than 30,000 Ukrainian armed force. We buy, we purchase uh, arm, armament in common, ammunition supply system. So, you know, this seems obvious because the war, the war is at our doors, but uh, for Europe, it was a cultural revolution. And so far, we're doing well. When it comes to hybrid uh, threats, you know, we need to share analysis, we need to share warnings, even though the, if the competence to respond is a national one and or domestic one, and even if the uh, retaliation is still limited. Progress are welcome, most welcome. Um, getting um, involved, the European Parliament is involved in this, even though in the treaty we have little room. Little room is granted to us, but we took our position that we want to drive, to propose, and to control what was said. We will never accept uh, speeches. We want to see action, and we want to see results. Therefore, the progresses are welcome. They're still fragile and certainly insufficient. Fragile because at the level of European Union, each decision has to do be the has to be anonymously approved. All you need is a Trojan horse from a third power for everything to stall. This uh, Trojan horse does exist. It's called Hungary, you know that of Viktor Orban. It is uh, happy to block uh, negotiations or negotiation that will be very much like blackmail blackmailing. You know, for example, the peace. Uh, Project European Peace Project is blocked by Hungary. It is uh, it's been uh, uh, joined by Slovakia. So now we're facing uncertainty and Ukraine with us. Fragile. Our cultural revolution is also insufficient because sometimes we just accept words. We just you know feed on words. We do more for Ukraine than we've ever done for anybody else for any other country. But no, it's not sufficient neither at the transatlantic level nor at the European level or at the level of each partner. We are not in a war economy. We are not even in a support economy, a war support economy, whereas the Ukraine war is existential for the future of Europe. Let me remind you what the Minister uh, of Foreign Affairs said in, from Ukraine. If the West does not help us won, win the war, which war will the West be able to win? We don't have a choice. Joe Biden is probably the last American president to have a European culture. He is himself facing problems in his country because the Chamber of the represent the Chamber of Representatives votes military support to Israel but not to Ukraine. Anyway, we cannot always rely on the United, on the U.S. and on the vote of a few uh, U.S. Uh, voters in one of the swing states. We know that the presidential American election uh, is will be, and for us, the election of all dangers. We must learn 
we, we must take our responsibility. This is what uh, strategic autonomy is all about. It's not against the U.S. It's in the case of, and because we have geographical priorities, the Mediterranean Sea is one of them, the first one. These are priorities, obvious priorities for all of us, and not always obvious for the U.S. We cannot allow Russia win the war in, in Ukraine. We cannot decide to act or not act, support or not support a reinforcement of the state in Libya, the fight against the scattering of the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict throughout the region, just because uh, who is running the White House, just be to, to please whoever is running the White House. And I'm an Atlantist, you know, I claim to be, but, you know, now we've had three American presidents who say, handle you, you know, handle it, take care of it of yourself, you know, take care of it yourself. So, you know, take seriously your issue of defense, at least for the neighboring of your continent, you know, even if it is, um, even the, the entire continent, we can no longer say that we didn't know that the uh, anti-neighboring uh, area is fragile, you know, east, south. We, we can no longer uh, look in the rearview mirror and ignore reality, you know. We don't want to, uh, you know, uh, f dwell on the nostalgia of the past in terms of uh, f previous foreign policies, which was supposed or supposedly efficient. The world is changing, is moving. Uh, the authoritarian regimes want to make them make it their playground. We cannot adopt their method. We we have to stop them. We have to uh, make sure that they will not damage our society, our model of democracy. It's not a problem of uh, geopolitical experts. It is every citizen's business today. What we have to, certainly Russia, but possibly China, and all authoritarian regimes agree upon uh, to fight or to go into conflict is what we succeeded to do. What we've succeeded, peace, freedom, prosperity, democracy, simply because they did not achieve it, simply because without realizing it, we are the most attractive model in the world. We are, we, the European Union, the only political space that sovereign nations want to uh, want to become member of without being forced. There is no other. So, be men, women, children come to our coastlines, you know, uh, to the peril of their lives. So, you know, to for a better future. So, the. The, the, what is the attractive power of Russia or China? Well, do you see migrants who try to go to live in Moscow or, or Beijing? Well, we forgot the value of what we are, the value of what we have inherited. The, we became the uh, sort of the, uh, you know, the elite bourgeois, sleeping bourgeois of prosperity. And, uh, and we claimed to have won battles that we never fought. As of now, we know that we will need to uh, fight, not necessarily in the battlefield, but we have to mobilize ourselves, our energies, to protect what we are, starting by, prote by the protection of democracies which look toward us and which are being attacked. Huge program, would have said General de Gaulle, and I'm absolutely certain uh, like the, that, you know, uh, for those who use uh, Gerald, quote Gerald de Gaulle to look backwards, you know, he would say something very close to what I tried to share with you today. And uh, because at each, each time there was a fight between democracies and dictatorships, he was on the side of, side of the democracies. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Good morning, madam. Thank you, first of all, for your presentation, for your paper. I'd like to ask you, 
a question on one aspect. Um, I think I misunderstood it. You said a dichotomy between the West, uh, the U.S. and Europe, and the uh, authoritarian regimes, and you raised, you, t you talked about uh, the, the West having a, a very slight responsibility in the conflicts that uh, strike our region. Uh, I'd like to know if that what you meant to say, because in my opinion, it's not necessarily the truth when you take the case of Libya or Iraq. We have a, a genuine responsibility in what's happening today. The intervention of Europe and of the U.S. Uh, has changed for decades, these countries, because we took action without thinking of the future. We figured, yes, we had to, to overthrow these uh, authoritarian regimes, but without thinking of the future or the day after. So my question, thank you. So thank you for your question and for giving me the opportunity to clarify something that maybe wasn't clear enough. First of all, I'm talking as a Frenchman, a European, and a Westerner. I didn't say the West against the West of the world. I didn't say that. And I don't want us to fall into that trap that is set before us. So the people talking about the global South as if it was united in its aspirations in its alliances and in its behaviors. You know, it's been about two years since the Global South has become the trendy expression. You know, I remember a Pakistani minister who had taken the floor in a meeting uh, telling me, I expressed myself on, uh, in the name of the glo Global South, and I asked him if he was expressing himself uh, for, uh, on, in the name of Indian, uh, India, and that had, uh, you know, uh, made our exchange quite uh, different. You know, I'm thinking of Taiwan, Japan, Korea. I'm thinking of Armenia, I mentioned uh, earlier. The aspiration, democratic aspirations exist. They are uh, fought against violently by reg author authoritarian regimes. And also said what I thought uh, within the Europe of what I thought of Hungary and Viktor Orban, of uh, uh, candidate country, uh, Serbia or Turkey, the relationship between with democracy and a state of law is uh, questionable. And uh, we, we don't, let's not give lessons, but let's recognize that there are syste systematic attacks from on behalf of, um, um, uh, uh, from uh, authoritarian regimes. And if we don't recognize that, we don't see what's happening, especially for hybrid wars. These attacks are systematic. Uh, it's extraordinary that we find the hand of Russia uh, in the referendum uh, on the Brexit, in the refer uh, pseudo referendum in, in Catalonia, in the presidential elections in the US in 2016. If those are not attacks against democracy, well, what are they? And uh, on the responsibility uh, regarding the situation in the south of the Mediterranean, our responsibility, I share what you're saying, but only partly. Uh, I share it because uh, I agree with you, because uh, the war in 2003 in Iraq was a pure madness. And uh, France and part of Europe had alerted uh, a friend. And, and alerting a friend is uh, giving him a service. You know, it's uh, helping him alerting them that it would weigh on the rest of the Middle East, that war in 2003. And if you analyze the interviews uh, from uh, with Jacques Chirac dating back to September 2002 in the New York Times, uh, just before what happened in the past, there's not one word that should be changed on a terrorist risk, on the risk of uh, giving Iran uh, the keys of uh, the Middle East or part of the Middle East. Everything's there in this speech. And on Libya, I mentioned that earlier to say that our illusion was to think that uh, overthrowing Gaddafi would be enough, uh, that a kind of domino terror theory would uh, turn the uh, Arab Springs uh, to flourish everywhere. We didn't pay attention on the building of a Libyan state. We didn't pay attention to that. Uh, the possibility of building a Libyan state, and I recognize and I believe I think I said that, I mentioned that at, at the time, but simply uh, to bear the responsibility of the fact that Iran, Russia, Turkey uh, spread 
in the Middle East. And uh, so chaos, uh, no, we shouldn't bear the, we don't bear the responsibility for that. The responsibility of Lebanon, for example, what's happening in Lebanon. Uh, it's unfortunate that uh, the only structured organization is the Hezbollah in Lebanon, a, a party uh, associated to a terrorist group. I refuse to bear responsibility for that. We've never uh, worked to for the destabilization of Lebanon or never hoped for half a million deaths in, in, uh, in Syria. We were blinded when we thought that uh, Bashar al-Assad would just leave in three weeks. No. Uh, it was a wishful, wishful thinking. But let's look at who's present where, who acts where. And let's, uh, again, talk about Palestine, because there was a, Paris in a conference, a humanitarian conference in Paris yesterday uh, that was held. And there's a lot to say about the uh, misunderstandings in Europe uh, or uh, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, I think, uh, went beyond her competencies when she visited Israel and she held a position that was not representative. Uh, I think she was not aware of the realities of the region, made a mistake, even though I will visit Israel soon and go to the uh, West Bank. And naturally, my first reflex will be to talk about the solidarity of, with a country that has uh, suffered from terrorism, uh, even uh, more seriously than what we saw in, at the Bataclan. And we're very happy to benefit from the international solidarity and we owe it to Israel. It doesn't mean that we share the choices of the present uh, Israeli government uh, to let uh, the colonies spread out, the uh, settlements continue, uh, and for not having worked in the last years uh, on the perspectives of peace. Uh, we have to be able to, to say both things at the same time. And on Palestine, I can't stand hearing uh, from some of our interlocutors from the south of the Mediterranean to th that it's our fault, that we do nothing, when the first donor uh, to the Palestinian territories is and remains the EU. The EU. Where are these people who give us lessons? Who, what do they do? Who organizes a human humanitarian uh, conference on Gaza? Who does that? It's easy to, to, to use emotions, you know, on the Palestinian cause. I understand that. But I also know that it's often a motive for protests accepted in the south of the Mediterranean as an exitory. And that's too easy. And because uh, I didn't see the same crowds cry for the half a million deaths in Syria. I didn't see these people. I didn't see the same crowds wondering what was happening for the future of a people that the, Kurd, the Kurds in Kurdistan. I didn't see the same crowds uh, be alarmed by what's happening in Darfur, for example, which is an absolute horror. Let's talk about two weeks. I didn't see the same crowds go out, go out in the streets at, at the time of Bucha. Uh, those who use to give all this to, to give lessons. Uh, where us, we should always, always think of what we do. Yeah, because if the Middle East and the Near East are in the state they are, it's by definition a collective failure. And I think I was clearer on my positions. Bonjour, Madame. Good morning, Madam. I am a su su law student in international relations. I will um, try to be as clear as possible my question for you. Shouldn't we? Uh, with Taiwan, shouldn't we uh, bring a coalition support, the same support as we did propose to Ukraine? For me, it's the real war for the future. And couldn't we, once and for all, recognize that China has not a, no place in the Western world today, as it is today? So I have two hours to answer this. <laughs> so the Mediterranean. Uh, uh, 
was extended a bit, yeah, to, to China. But thank you for talking about Taiwan. I was in last summer. I was in Taiwan. I gave that as an example of democracy just earlier. Um, it was said before in my long bi biography. It reminds me of the age I have. I'll soon be a grandmother. But anyway, um, I did Langues Orientales, so uh, I studied Chinese, Mandarin Chinese. And I remember of the time where, when uh, Communist China and Taiwan uh, walked hand in hand. And uh, they practically had never uh, any reasons of uh, having disputes or disagreements for one simple reason. It was because Taiwan was not a democracy. It had not become what it is today, i.e. the proof that we can be profoundly Chinese, with a, a member of the Chinese civilization, with the Chinese culture, and deeply democratic and prosperous. And so it's a provocation uh, for uh, Beijing. And you're right, a bit like uh, Ukraine, the democracy looking out to the West uh, is a provocation for Moscow. And the diplomat I was once was would rather say that our work is to stop this war, to avoid, to do everything we can to avoid this war, to maintain the status quo as it is today. And it's uh, uh, there are a lot of us uh, that work on that to, to that effect to, to, to for that purpose. Uh, the cost of a military operation for Beijing would be prohibitive. It would be disproportionate. In reality, the economic ties and human relations between uh, continental China, uh, mainland China, and Taiwan are such that um, uh, so-called uh, military victory would be a big defeat for many other or many many other aspects for Beijing and I think it, it's difficult but we can manage the risk and the Taiwanese are uh, aware of aware of that is the hybrid type war because they live that every day uh, infinite number of cyber attacks disinformation continuous different disinformation campaigns uh, 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 all kinds of attempts, and it's interesting to see uh, uh, what they do to to respond to that. And we have a lot to learn from them. It was said, uh, I had the uh, European Parliament uh, adopt uh, a report on the uh, actions against democracies, and that's why I went into Taiwan to see how the Taiwanese society had taken charge of the fight against uh, against these actions, not the state, not the politics, not the politicians, not the administrations, the citizens. They have the power. They were granted the power, and they act on a daily basis much faster, much more credibly than politicians that everywhere in the world, and uh, uh, I'm a politician myself, uh, were discredited. And I think that's what we should do. That's what we need to do, convince Beijing that they have a lot more to lose than to win in a, a, a military adventure. On this standpoint, I think, we again, we have to help support Ukraine to win because it's our credibility that's at stake. It's the credibility of democracies uh, faced with the uh, authoritarian regimes that's at stake. And we have to learn from the uh, Taiwan experience to see how we fight against uh, hybrid uh, threats and uh, not only through uh, state agencies, but also by sharing, as we're doing this morning, with the citizens. Uh, share the, uh, the, 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 the responsibility of what's happening and giving the citizens the power and the means to be the genuine actors of our vaccination against an anti-democratic -dem pandemic. So, madam, thank you so much for your brilliant, uh, for your brilliant speech. I, uh, I'm a basic European citizen that's taking the floor here. And the question I'd like to address uh, is in with the uh, enlargement, the uh, broadening of Europe, uh, we're going to go from 27, 32, 33, 35 member states. It's obvious that our uh, ways of uh, functioning uh, do not 
at the present time correspond to the situation and, and more and more uh, we will be faced with a need to restructure uh, review the organization and what are according to you uh, how we can restructure Europe uh, uh, how can we counter or face these issues of unanimously uh, unanimous decisions uh, the tro Trojan horse that you mentioned uh, should we still go on a majority rather than unanimous votes? And generally speaking, uh, what should be the orientation of Europe? Should, should it head for a, a federation type of organization like the United States of Europe? Well, thank you. Thank you for this question. Yes. Th thank you for this question, which uh, uh, animates me. And, um, of course, this calls for a lot of... Uh, reflection nowadays, I will start by saying one thing. I strongly believe that what you just raised, a bit like a, a fatality, is a good, good news. The enlargement or of Europe is the proof of our attractiveness and an opportunity to create a European bloc in a world that is closing down. Uh, whether we just observe it, it was a way of weighing even more, and it's proof that the model to which we are used to, that we criticize, is still what is probably the best system compared to others, and that uh, Ukrainians they are already European by the blood they shed. I'm convinced of that. I've visited Ukraine five times uh, since the beginning of the war, and I'll go back because I don't want to talk about Ukraine without knowing what I'm talking about. That Moldavia uh, has the courage, Moldavia has the courage to do, like Ukraine, the necessary reforms uh, so that the uh, European Commission uh, got to the point where it recommended the negotiations of its adhesion. It's uh, adm admirable. These are countries that did not uh, stay still. And sometimes I think it would be good for us to, uh, to, 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 to visit these countries to find the fervor that exists there. But it's, a, it's an incredible challenge. And you're absolutely right. And it's good news. It's been years now that so because the, the Balkan, the Balkans are uh, ever complex zones, sometimes deceiving, we just push back the idea of the enlargement of Europe, saying they're not ready and they should make reforms and things, so we just move to something else. But today, thanks to Ukraine and Moldavia, we figure, oh, they should be ready, but we'll have to make reforms. And that's ex excellent news because, as you said, clear, uh, uh, very rightly, uh, with 27 doesn't work well. I was uh, the government, I was in the general affairs uh, 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 department, I would say that every day on the agenda there are 27 people taking the floor. The dynamic of the decision-making process is a bit hindered, let's say. It's fine to listen to each other, but it's good to, dis to make decisions sometimes. We, we manage sometimes, but, you know, we get there, but uh, uh, you have to have pit bull dogs uh, so that uh, things... <laughs> Uh, happen. So, of course, we have to review the governance of the EU, the question of uh, unanimous decisions. Well, you bounce on that, and you were right. But be reassured, there are a lot of uh, topics that are not decided unanimously, most decisions. Uh, there was one topic on which, uh, wrongly, I think, uh, we had rallied to a consensus, and that's why we didn't do for years. It was the migration issue. We didn't dare apply the treaties and decide on the basis of a majority. And lastly, uh, well, at last, this year, we pulled out of this uh, uh, soft consensus, I would call it, uh, or, and we never were closer to a balanced European position, efficient position on migration issues because we stopped – you know, bring in those the obstacles that weren't there. You know, there's uh, three topics on which unanimous unanimity is uh, required. The enlargement of Europe. Uh, we all have to agree to uh, welcome new members. 
uh, tax fiscal aspects, which is dramatic because we have a, a single market, we have a, a single currency, but we have economies that are competing with one another, and we're not m making progress. So uh, we have some trade but that doesn't work, and of course the foreign policies and defense policies. It took us a long time to, for us French to understand that the unanimity uh, in terms of uh, foreign affairs was uh, was an hindrance, and we had uh, proof of that uh, recently. So it can't. It, it has to be a qualified majority, maybe different from what we do today. A different majority. A lot of thought is given to that. Experts are involved. French, France, and Germany have uh, really kick things around and things are happening now, things are moving in terms of defense. Uh, maybe I have one red line, one limit, and I uh, uh, impose this on the most federalist members. I am I, I'm for efficiency. I couldn't care less about the color, uh, if it's white, uh, of the cat, if it's white or black, uh, as long as it catches the mice. Uh, but my red line in terms of defense is when we have uh, European missions that we call executive missions, that is, in a complex environment uh, where we run the risk of, uh, uh, of uh, jeopardizing the life of all soldiers. And for me, uh, the head of the army is the president of the republic. He is the person who takes the decision to take the chance of uh, jeopardizing a life. It's the president of the republic. There's no telephone number in Brussels for that. Yeah, so it's it's really the responsibility of the president. You know, we have to end also the misunderstandings between president of the count council, president of the commission, uh, the revolving presidency of the ministers of the Euro EU, uh, all this red tape and everything. So it's so complex. And and recently in Israel, uh, we did we saw the demonstration that it doesn't work with the visit of. Uh, Mrs. Van der Leyen, and when there's no goodwill, uh, it's a disaster on behalf of the people. So we have to stop, full stop. But we have to be ready. Uh, each member state has to be ready that someone is the spokesperson for the EU, a single person, and has the visibility and the strength to do that. So I think we have to do our homework at home, and we have to accept our mistakes. I don't know if it, uh, us French are ready for that, I have a single responsibility, but I know uh, f a Spanish uh, philosopher told me once in a conference in Madrid, in Europe, there are no big or small countries. They're the small countries and those who don't know <laughs> that they're small. <laughs> they're the small countries and those who don't know that they're small. <laughs> Good morning, madam. Good morning. I'm sorry. I have the spotlights in the eyes. I, can't, I come from a country of the south, which is not the global south. I come from a country of the south shores of the Mediterranean, uh, whereas you uh, clearly said uh, the tensions, the emotions are strong uh, with a view to the crisis, what's happening in Gaza. Uh, you said that who were, were these populations, where were these populations with the injustices with the Kurd Kurds uh, and with the uh, the events in the region, everything? Where were these people? Uh, you're right on that, that we didn't react, us countries from the south. But does this – what about – the, the silence or the fact that we let people be killed in the Middle East. In my opinion, I understand this as since you didn't talk about these problems, since you were absent, since uh, you also have two weights, two measures. Uh, so uh, uh, you say that you shouldn't be criticized. But you're in a position, whether you or the West or Europe or the U.S., you're in a position that is um, better than ours, more comfortable uh, for us as a population of the South who already disagree with uh, those who govern uh, us. But I think that we 
authorizing or letting um, the activities of Is Israel for 70 years be stay unpunished. Uh, the uh, UN directives were not accepted. We authorize slaughters that take place on both sides. Uh, you know, we authorize that. Uh, like what's happening in Ukraine. Of course, P Putin is relaxed. It's good for Putin that things are happening like that in Gaza. In my opinion, we need to act so as to not let hatred uh, <coughs> give more hatred and violence generate more uh, violence. But I think we need to communicate and try to bring people to reason and respect the international law, which is uh, just uh, disavowed. And uh, uh, international law is used by some and forgotten by others. So thank you. Thank you, so thank you to go back on this uh, essential issue. Uh, obviously, uh, you heard what I said in my introductory uh, words. There were the Oslo agreements, and the international community as a whole did not react early enough to the alert, uh, alarms or alerts uh, the warnings that um, uh, that came from those who were not seeking peace and the imposed silence to those who were fighting for peace uh, on both sides. And so, it, uh, you know, it's not just uh, uh, the fact that uh, Gaza is under the uh, the authority of uh, Hamas, you know, it led to the fact that the, the worst pogrom was was created on the 7th of October. And the 7th of October remains uh, a moment. Uh, there will be a before and an after 7th of October. It's not the same thing to do an intifada with stones and to burn a live child in a oven. In an oven. I looked... Uh, I saw the images shot by the Hamas and what happened on the 7th of October. It's 45 minute long, 47 minute long. And I met uh, families of hostages in, in the meantime. And I understood, you know, getting a, a blow on the stomach, I was bent in half like any other human being would. And I'm sure that uh, if I saw images of what's happening today in Gaza, I would have the same you know, blow in the stomach. Nobody s says that you should remain silent on the settlements. And even the Biden administration is, doesn't stay silent with the settlement issue. Nobody says we need to wash our hands on what's happening in Gaza. Yesterday in Paris, there was a conference, again, that brought together uh, that managed to uh, collect 1 billion euros for the Gaza Strip and uh, reiterated the, uh, the plea for a uh, ceasefire. No, for uh, uh, a truce leading to a ceasefire and seeking a political solution. But the question is, do we all agree with a, solu a solution with of two states recognizing the existence of Israel. Because what happened on the 7th of October was the denial of the existence of uh, Israel. That's at the basis of the Hamas. And we won't make pe reach peace with Hamas. Palestine must free itself from Hamas. When we hear uh, the uh, leaders of Hamas recognize that the tunnels are meant to protect the, fi the soldiers and not the civilians, recognize that uh, they knew that the uh, slaughter of the 7th of October would trigger uh, a, a retaliation and uh, from Israel and a lot of Palestinian deaths, but it was the price to pay to pull out of the status quo, knowing that Gaza is not occupied. I am, for the moment, just like you. I'm flabbergasted. I'm very pessimistic on the, the months, weeks and months to come, but I hope, I want to hope that on each side, those who were obstacles to peace lose their capacity of nuisance at the occasion of this crisis. That's what we have to work on. That's what we have to hope. And we have to do that together. 
It's fine that we have this opportunity to have a dialogue together because we agree on practically everything. So to stop, uh, you know, blaming each other, saying you did nothing and so on and so on. Would have liked to do it, but my uh, the authorities don't want. We have to do that together. We have to stop saying that the Abraham agreements were enough because they were absolutely not enough. But we have to stop saying that the Abraham uh, Abraham uh, agreements uh, uh, correspond to recognized in the state of Israel because it was not a scandal. It was as good as what Egypt and Jordan did. N that's not what brings. Peace between Israel and Palestine, but it uh, shows a, a political courage. So let's not blame those who are ready to engage themselves and have courage, because it will otherwise it will continue uh, to be the, f the case where uh, those who will have uh, who have the courage won't be there anymore. Um. First of all, thank you very much for your clarification, your explanations to the various questions. I do have a question as well, which pertains to a, well, a, a need for clarification for a topic which is not Mediterranean, but we t you talked about it at length, Ukraine. You several times you said that it, it is necessary to fight for Ukraine. There is a Ukrainian peace plan which calls for the uh, recovery of the territories uh, with the pre-1914 uh, borders. And now, will France support the Ukrainian plan, which includes the uh, 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 having, you know, taking uh, President Putin before an international court of justice? You know, I mean, it's going to take is, I mean, we know it's going to take a while before Ukraine recovers its entire territory. Will France support Ukraine till the end, or the possibility is the possibility to negotiate with Russia acceptable at a given stage in this uh, process? Thank you. Well, I'm not speaking on behalf of French diplomacy. I did that in another life, and um, but not today. I talk on my own name, in, in the name of the European Parliament, uh, because I'm a uh, president of a, a commission of the European Parliament. You know, when I talk, I represent the position of the European Parliament. There is a peace plan, the one designed by uh, Volodymyr Zelensky. There is no P Russian peace plan. There is one country which did not attack anybody and which sets the conditions for which, according to which he will accept a peace. And there is Russia, which is inventing a tale. You know, uh, we had the Nazi regime. Today we got the Ukrainian arms in the, in the Middle East, of course. Ukrainians have so many weapons, they actually, you know, give them to the Middle East. You know, they, they, you know, they export them to the Middle East. We all know that. It's obvious. <laughs> So when will peace or ceasefire will prevail? Well, when the Ukrainians will decide. Because let me remind you that we do not fight. They do fight. We do, are not losing any soldier. They do. That we are uh, comfy in this beautiful uh, venue, whereas they will enter, start winter, and they don't know if they will have electrical power, water, or either of them, you know, I experienced that in Kiev, you know, this uh, last winter, we would go from one house to another to see who had what, and sometimes uh, people had nothing, except maybe the wish to, the, the envy to protect their country. And there is international law, we tend to forget that. It is a bit uh, outdated what I'm saying, but you know, international talks about the in territorial integrity of states and the in territorial integrity of Ukraine, well, it is the, within the borders which have been internationally recognized. Nobody recognized the fact that Crimea is Russian, that the Donbass Republic 
has had the right to uh, declare unilateral independence, except Russia and some of its satellites, and not even all of them. So it's not, you know, by chance that uh, it's not trivial. Do you sh we should remember that we'd like to just get back to international law and not international disorder imposed by dictatorships. But if before that, Ukraine says, well, I'm giving up, I'm exhausted, who will we be to say, no, keep going, keep fighting? You know, nobody will be uh, allowed to do that. They fight for themselves, but I'd like to remember that they, remember that they fight for our own safety. You know, what safety guarantee, uh, security guarantee can Europe, NATO, uh, could Europe or NATO provide to Ukraine? But now, we should be aware of the fact that Ukraine is our security guarantee against Russian threats today at a stage, at a time when Sweden is not part of NATO. Sweden is not, still not part of NATO. And it is the action of Turkey and Hungary, as I mentioned early on, at a stage where, uh, you know, hybrid attacks uh, take place in our, on our territory. Well, clearly there is a Russian threat. We didn't want to, you know, we were collectively dependent on Russia for gas. So Rush, Ukraine is weakening the uh, Russian uh, military uh, adventure. You know, we have to help Ukraine and we need to understand uh, the time when uh, Ukraine will decide that uh, it's done enough. This is my position. This is what I stand for. It's a reasonable stand. And I want to associate that with the fact that we have to do more, really more than what we more than what we do today for Ukraine. I talked about the uh, European Union ammunition plan. It's a great idea, new idea. Well, I like new ideas. You know, they take a while to be implemented. We impress by our audacity, and then we seem to be self-satisfied because we we think we've done something. We promised one million ammunition uh, items to Ukraine. You know. We've reached 300,000, we're far from that, but North, North Korea since August has sent 1 million ammunition items to, uh, to Russia. So if the European Union cannot do what Northern Korea, North Korea does, you know, we'll become an insignificant uh, peninsula, you know, west of Russia. Thank you. Now, I'd like to come back to the Middle East and Europe in the press recently, uh, we talked about the renewal of animosity between uh, Serbia and Kosovo in the Balkan. In your opinion, is there a risk of a new uh, of a new crisis in this region? Thank you for bringing us back to the Balkans, because again, and I mentioned it in my introduction. It took us uh, hours, you know, including Srebrenica, as you mentioned, you know, in Bosnia, to force to understand the scope of what was going on we, in the geographical, historical heart of Europe. And we did act, and thank God for that. But then there was Kosovo, and we acted, and thank God for that as well. But still, we did not achieve peace, coexistence, and recognition of one another. Tension uh, still prevail, and the middling, foreign middling, are constant Russians, Turkish, uh, from Gulf countries. Uh, go to Sarajevo and look at the uh, look at the buildings, the plaques that says who give what library, what city hall what foreign country and you will see that it is a festival european union with its usual talent we don't see what uh, it give it gave but uh, whereas it gave a lot fortunately NATO, the european union uh, are still keep keeping vigil uh, very attentive uh, about what's going on between kosovo kosovo and serbia it's very very tense very dangerous what is going on in bosnia so we could say, okay, well, those countries uh, have not yet uh, come to term with their history. They're not ready to join Europe. Uh, we'll pay attention to them when they'll be ready. It would be a mistake. It would be a huge mistake because, again, look at the map. If we don't pay attention to 
us, to them, they will pay attention to us. And because all the powers want to turn them into their uh, operational base in Europe. So we don't have a choice. We have to be present, politically speaking, militarily speaking, with civilians, you know, working in uh, for the police force for a certain number of uh, topics. And very modestly, because there is no quick win uh, in the Balkan. There will be no quick win in the, ba in the Balkan. The, it will be generations to come who might define themselves differently, differently from the way their parents had to define themselves, that is, vis-a-vis -vis an ethnic identity. But we are not there yet. And uh, what we have to see, the competition of initiatives, that is, uh, the British on the one hand, uh, the uh, Americans on the other, the Americans, and in the middle, of course, uh, all those who, with, in bad faith, said that they can play one against the other. So we're not always very good about that. You know, we've made progress, we've made headways, but we need to understand that uh, we have to act together in the same way between the European Union and NATO. I spent a lot of time with the British, as was said, because I am uh, chaired the uh, Euro-Britannic uh, Parliamentary Assembly. I go to London, I receive the British in, uh, in uh, Brussels to tell them, well, we, even though if we don't have any agreement with the United Kingdom for foreign policy and defense, for the, in the Balkans we have to get together, we have to be together, because we were present at, in tragic times, and we have to be present to make sure that it, will, it won't happen again. It will not happen again, and we have to be together and not in competition. There is, on the British side, you know, we, uh, we've gone, you know, every, you know the, the British have uh, gone out, come out of their bad br Brexit period, you know, every, where they rejected everything from Europe. And now they're out of this. And now each time the crisis started, it had been stopped. But, you know, it is still fire. It is still milk on the fire. Milk on the fire and it could boil out rapidly. I have to stop sorely. I have to stop, you know. You know, um, <laughs> nothing to say, nothing to say, Mrs. Member of Parliament, you know, uh, there, are, there are still Plenty of questions, but time is uh, fully running short. The purpose of this dialogue is to establish a dialogue to to deal with uh, difficult issues without getting mad, and uh, to uh, to put rational uh, rationality where uh, in topics uh, about in to on topics where emotion and irrationality gain ground. So. As a keynote speaker, you give us a new perspective, you know, uh, you know, it comes from your history, your position, your commitments, and I think we're all aware of that. So the, the, the round of applause shows, bear witness of your success. Thank you very much, madam. Thank you very much.